So uh, once meeting, uh, we won't uh, allow any new comment cards to be added to the pile. So if you have any comments that you're gonna make tonight, fill out a comment card, turn it into Ms. Martinez right there, okay? Okay, Council, it is seven o'clock. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I call this meeting to order. Okay. Up next, we have a roll call. Ms. Martinez. Councillor Vigil. Here. And Councillor Krebs is on excuse tonight for her absence and I think that's it. So all counselors present except for Councillor Krebs. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martinez. Up next, we have the agenda approval. Councillor Griego. I'll make the motion to approve the agenda as presented. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Councillor Vigil? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Okay, up next is where we have citizen comments. This is the segment of the uh, agenda to where the comment cards that Ms. Martinez have, we will call the names of the ones who've turned in comments cards. We will ask that you come up to the podium uh, and you could start making your comments. We do have a three minute limit on the comments and there's the clock. If you're still talking at the three minute mark, I will politely ask you to end uh, your comments at that time. Um, the first person I have is uh, Ms. Donna Weehy. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Donna Weehy, citizen of uh, and resident of the city of Alamosa. And I also want to disclose that I do serve on the Alamosa Advisory Board as the healthcare representative. A couple of things I've learned in the past three to four years sitting on this advisory council, especially when I came back from a conference in Salida, somebody at the stage that was doing a presentation said, Colorado is in a crising housing crisis and the answer is more housing. And then I remember through the years talking to the outreach folks at La Puente and different mental health counselors that when you take a person who's homeless and put them in an apartment without any services, a lot of times it's failure. So a good solution to that, that we've watched and seen in other communities, a best practice that the city here is hoping to adopt is to build small single home homes without any barriers to entry other than the person is willing to try to change their life and get off the streets. And it will include wraparound services. And that is a feeling and a hope and a desire. And it's shown that it can work and it won't work 100% of the time. So I am very much in favor of the city and the nonprofit agencies and the grant funders to build tiny cottages, homes, whatever you wanna call them, with wraparound services to provide for the fringe community members who really desire to make a change in their life 
And coming from a healthcare perspective, it's really hard for people to keep appointments, to look for a job, to straighten out their lives when they have no support. They've burned all their bridges. They might have a substance use problem that they can't get rid of because they keep hanging around the same friends that keep bringing them back into the same bad habits and they've made bad choices over and over again. But in healthcare, it's really hard. If you understand Mavlov's hierarchy of needs, uh, Dr. Tamberg talked about it this morning at his address. You can't really address the underlying health condition when they're worried about where their next meal is and that they're going to freeze to death that night. So I'm very much in favor of this, and I'm really proud of the city councilors and the leadership to take these programs and really not just give it lip service, but really try to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you. And I have to leave. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Up next, we have Ruthie Brown. Good evening, Ruthie Brown. I live at 711 State Avenue. I was here two weeks ago questioning um, four-day work week, whatever, um, and I listened to the response and it went on and on and on and on. And first of all, I do want you to remember it is America. I do have a right to a, an opinion. I do not believe I voice only for myself. Um, and I, I have to say, just because a person went to college and can give me the data and the status and above the mark and below below the mark and give me more data and say how we have to pay more to get more people and da 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 da. Well, I don't have that luxury because I'm I'm using my money and city council is also using my money. It's not your money. So as a layperson. What I see is that you want to spend $850,000 to $1.3 million on raises. So it's not your money. It's, it's our money who work for it. Um, beyond this, I've been wanting to come for an awfully long time, and I've lost my courage, and I've lost my nerve. And I, I do want to ask, I've been here for 50 years in Alamosa, and I want to know, when did we become a community of fear? When did it become okay to not let employees speak up if they didn't agree? When did it become okay to tell employees to look the other way if they didn't agree with what was going on? Or tell an employee, I can fire you too. Um, you know, I talk to and with many people at the store, at the grocery store, on the streets, wherever. This is wrong. Um, and here's what I hear overwhelmingly from your own employees is they hate what the homeless shelter has done to the Alamosa community. They hate the homeless camp and what it's done to Alamosa. And they hate our downtown traffic plan still to this day. And yet they can't speak up for fear of losing their jobs. Now, if you aren't hearing any of these comments anywhere where you go, maybe you need to get outside of your circle of acquaintances or friends and expand that a little bit. And that being said, I drew a great map how to get to the south side. So when you're coming down or going to the airport or the county building, you know how to get to the green spot. Uh, I don't know if I've seen any of the talk they want to sign, but it's not a very professional talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next we have uh, Miss Judy McNeil Smith. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Judy McNeil Smith. I've been a resident of Alamosa since 1992. So I've lived here longer than anywhere else, hard to believe. Um, I'm here as a citizen to basically thank the city council for looking at the fact that we do not have enough affordable housing. And with all the issues that come with anything, I just hired a staff that um, 
at a decent salary is having a really hard time to find affordable housing. Um, you, she's got, she's got uh, two kids and her partner, her partner doesn't have a job yet. And she's really looking at coming and joining our community, but she's really struggling in terms of paying more in her rent than I pay on my mortgage. And so I applaud the city council for um, not having an easy answer, but please, um, hear me that I'm glad that you're looking at the at the options. When I moved here in 1992, we only got a rental because my husband taught at the college and one of his colleagues found a rental place for us, sight unseen because there was no housing for my husband and my four-year-old and six-year-old. Um, it hasn't gotten any better, it's only gotten worse. So um, there are issues with everything that we do, but I think we need to be creative and open to whatever those situations may be. And I just want to thank the council for taking on the hard issues and saying we need affordable housing. And um, it's going to look a lot different in different places, but thank you for being courageous and taking that on. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kate Jack. Hello, Council. Everyone, thank you for having me this evening and for your time. My name is Kate Jack. I am the Director of Communications for San Luis Valley Behavioral Health Group. Um, I'm a longtime resident of the San Luis Valley. I grew up in Monta Vista. I've lived in Alamosa County since 2016. Um, I'm here to advocate today for the housing project that's happening on Airport Road. I'm happy. I'm, I should disclose as well that I was part of the, the grant writing team to get the funding um, to put this housing project together. So it was grant funding that is paying for this project. Um, I know that data is sometimes hard to look at for folks when it comes to housing or any other topic, but the fact is data is is the facts. And the fact is that we are in the county of, in the city of Alamosa, we are lacking 515 housing units, which is 12% of the total housing stock in the community. And as Judy just said, it's been a long time issue for the community. It's not something new that just arised. And this project that's currently um, under discussion, it is hitting a niche population. Those that are very, very vulnerable um, that Donna had discussed that have other contributing factors to their homelessness going on, maybe substance use disorder, maybe a lack of transportation, lack of childcare, uh, maybe a combination of those issues. And the great thing about this housing project is that it's it's proximity to San Luis Valley Behavioral Health Group and our ability to be able to help those people with wraparound supports, getting them the help that they need through counseling, substance use disorder, et cetera. Um, they also have Don and Mel Garris and the SLV Housing Coalition and their team there to help with that. So this is a great project that's gonna help people get on their feet that may have not had the opportunity to do so yet. Um, it's also going to help move the soup kitchen out of um, the area that it's currently in that I know has caused concern for citizens that live in that area. Um, I think long term, this is going to be great for the city of Alamosa. And while it's not going to combat the 12% lack of housing in our community, even a little bit is going to help. Two steps forward and one step back is still one step forward. And we have to remember too the other projects that the city of Alamosa is working on um, to combat, further combat the housing crisis here in the community. So I think us, all of us here as citizens should be in full support of everything that we can do to help the city of Alamosa combat this crisis together as a community rather than um, pointing at people that may be different than us or may be struggling in ways that we can't comprehend and helping them. Thank you, thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you. So, Ms. Martinez, um, I'm out of comment cards, so we're going to go to Zoom uh, now. And if you can give the uh, Zoom participants instructions of how to raise their hands, we'll recognize them and give them an opportunity uh, to speak as well. Yes, sir. If you're on the Zoom app and you want to speak, um, you'll use the raise hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're on a telephone, you'll dial star nine. Okay, and Mayor, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay, I don't see any hands raised either. So we'll go ahead and uh, turn everything over to our um, staff and uh, legal counsel for any follow-up on any of the comments. Uh, 
I'm sorry, Mayor, the city attorney was distracting me. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming no hands were raised from the public and now it's citizen or staff comment. Um, so I wanna thank um, everyone. I think we probably have some in the audience as well and maybe through Zoom that are here watching to see um, the discussion that we have as it relates to the, um, the yawn subdivision and the rezoning. So I just encourage anyone um, who is interested in that, the next few items should go fairly fast. And that is one of the first items on the agenda. Um, in regards to Ms. Brown's concerns as it relates to raises, I will be doing as part of my presentation for the budget, presenting some information as it relates to that. So I'm hopeful that Ms. Brown can um, stick around for that. Um, obviously I in no way mean to use my college degree or statistics or numbers to make her feel uncomfortable, but it is stuff that we do look at when we're making decisions from a city perspective. Um, I was a little surprised by the comments as it relates to a community of fear. Um, that's not the culture that we have here with the city. Um, I know that we probably very much do have some employees that are not in the same agreement of some of the efforts we're making as it relates to homelessness or the downtown as it's a reflection of the community. There's a diversity of opinions, but there's absolutely no one's job who is at risk in regards to having these different opinions. Um, we have a very supportive environment. So if there is some employee that is is feeling differently, um, they just need to bring that, that forward type of situation. So um, normally I don't comment on every opinion that's raised, but I think it's important to make sure we're clear on the, the culture that we do have here at the city. Thank you. Okay, let me just expand on that sure. a little bit. I think that's a baseless allegation that strikes at the very heart of what the city is. If there is any grounds to it, uh, the, the employee handbook speaks clearly on employees' rights to have their private opinions and express their private opinions. If there is any employee who feels that that is not being met, uh, I invite that employee to talk directly to me. That is certainly not the policy of the city and I would be astounded if it indeed is happening. And I would uh, guarantee that the city would take action if it's happening. Thank you so very much for the follow-up. We sure appreciate it. That brings us to uh, the next item on the agenda, ceremonial items. Uh, we have two proclamations tonight. Um, here on City Council, we believe in a team effort, so we collaborate together to make sure that we present uh, the proclamations. Tonight, I have uh, two council members helping me out. We have Council uh, Councilor Hensley, who will be reading the first uh, proclamation, and then Councilor Carson will be reading the second proclamation. So the first proclamation is the Adams State University Hispanic Serving Institution uh, proclamation. And if we can have um, Dr. Tanberg, if you would like to come up here and tell us a little bit about what's going on briefly, uh, and then we'll have um, Councillor Hensley read the proclamation and uh, come down and present it to you and take a picture afterwards. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. It means a lot to have the city uh, recognize this important aspect of the work we do at, at Adams State. And so Adams State University was the first institution in Colorado to be received the federal designation as a Hispanic serving institution um, or HSI in, in, in short. And that's a designation that recognizes that we've uh, enroll a certain percentage of uh, Hispanic students, and it makes us eligible to compete for additional federal dollars to serve to serve our students. And we've um, been a uh, we've had that designation for 25 years now, and had a successfully competed for grants on a continuous basis since then. Um, it's an important recognition of who we are, but also where we're located in the San Luis Valley, which. Um, has the largest share of Hispanic people as a region in the state and has the long and uh, distinguished history of um, being the uh, first uh, a Spanish colony, uh, part of Mexico, New Mexico, and uh, that tradition 
lives on um, very strongly here and we recognize it as our mission to serve from that uh, vantage point. And so this recognition, this proclamation means a great deal to us. Okay, thank you so very much, President Dr. Tanberg. So we'll go to um, Ms. Hensley. <laughs> So as somebody who, I'm in my 16th year at Adam State, so I'm very proud to be able to read this. So HSI Proclamation October 2023, whereas Adam State and the city of Alamosa are inseparable and valuable partners, and whereas Adam State has been the anchor regional public institution in Southern Colorado since 1921, and whereas Adam State contributes to Alamosa and the San Luis Valley, as one of its largest employers, and whereas Adam State provides rural Colorado with educational, cultural, and athletic interests for the availability and enjoyment of the surrounding community, and whereas Adam State prides itself on serving a broad and diverse student population, and whereas Adam State established itself as the state's first Hispanic serving institute, and in October 2023, celebrates the 25th anniversary of this milestone. Now, therefore, Ty Coleman, Mayor of the City of Alamosa, and on behalf of the entire City Council, recognizes Adam State University and its status as the premier Hispanic-serving institution in the state of Colorado, and proclaim October 2023 as Adam State University HSI Month. Thank you. Okay, Mayor, uh, I'd like yes. to make a couple comments if I may. Yes, it, go ahead, Council Grego. Uh, born and raised here in Alamosa. Talk into the mic if you don't mind. I'm sorry. I am one of the first out of my family to graduate from Adam State College, and I graduated with a business degree. My brother and I, we were in business for 37 years, uh, ran successfully five different businesses. So that's you know, great stories start here. Those are great stories. And it's a privilege to, to have something like that, especially Hispanic serving institution. And I've known a lot of Hispanics that have gone through the institution and are doing, uh, growing and growing. So this is a great thing. So thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. Okay, Councilor uh, Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, so Charlie grew up here, Councilor Griego grew up here. I came here for a job at Adams State over 20 years ago and have loved every minute since then. And so I think what Adams State brings to this community and the partnerships we have are so important and so vital to the entire San Luis Valley being successful um, and all of the people who have received their degrees, who have gotten associate's degrees, who have worked and gone to school at Adams State the institution does so many things to make our community better. And I just wanted to say thank you. And it's really a pleasure um, to recognize the HSI proclamation and that it's been 25 years and that we were the first in the state. Like the San Luis Valley, Alamosa, Adam State, we do some amazing things in this state. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that. So thank you for being here. And I'll wrap things up and um, also say thank you. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a son and a daughter who both uh, went to ASU and graduated, and uh, they're all for my payroll, so it's really good. Their mother is Hispanic, and I'm African-American, so uh, we have the diversity uh, in our kids, and, and Adam State is a diverse university, so I'm really proud of that. 
All right, thank you. That brings us to the next um, proclamation, Fire Prevention Week. Chief, I believe you're gonna come up to the podium. Thank you, sir. And then Councilor Carson is going to uh, help us with the uh, proclamation tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> Um, in 1871, uh, the Great Chicago Fire was the uh, impetus for uh, an anniversary 40 years later when President Cal Calvin Coolidge uh, spoke about the first uh, proclamation for Fire Prevention Week, which is the uh, week of the 9th of October, and that is to commemor commemorate the 300 lives lost and the methods in which uh, the fire uh, departments, the NFPA, can uh, find ways to reduce uh, fires like that and loss of life. Uh, this year's uh, uh, theme is cooking safety. Starts with you. Pay attention to fire prevention. Uh, every year there's a different theme, and each year it's changed up so that maybe we can affect another or a different area of the population so that we can reduce those numbers. And uh, anyway... I think that's about it. Thank you, Chief. Well, we're gonna go ahead and um, have Councilor Carson read the proclamation. Then we'll come down and um, um, present it to you. Whereas the city of Alamosa, Colorado is committed to Whereas the city of Alamosa, Colorado is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living and visiting in our community, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both local locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed more than 2,800 people in the United States in 2021, according to the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, and fire departments in the United States responded to 338,000 home fires, and whereas cooking is is the leading cause of home fires in the United States and fire departments responded to more than 166,400 annually between 2016 and 2020. And whereas two of every five homes fires start in the kitchen with 31% of these fires resulting from unattended cooking. And whereas more than half of reported non-fatal home cooking fires injuries occurred when the victims tried to fight the fire themselves and whereas children under five face a higher risk of non-fire burns associated with cooking than being burned in a cooking fire. And whereas Alamosa residents should <clears throat> turn pot handles toward the back of the stove and always keep a lid nearby when cooking, keep a three foot kid-free zone around the stove, oven and other things that could get hot. Watch what they heat watch what they heat and set a timer to remind them that they are cooking. And whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will be therefore more likely to survive a fire. And whereas smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires almost in half. And whereas the city of Alamosa's first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and fire, home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas the city of Alamosa's taken residents are are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2023 Fire Prevention Week theme, cooking safety starts with you, pay attention to fire prevention, effectively serves to remind us to stay alert and use caution when cooking to reduce the risk of kitchen fires. Now, therefore, Ty Coleman, Mayor of the City of Alamosa, and on behalf of the entire city council does hereby proclaim October 8th through 14th, 2023 as fire prevention week throughout the city. And I urge all people of the city of Alamosa to check their kitchens for fire hazards and use safe cooking practices during fire prevention week, 2023, and to support the many public safety activities and efforts of the city of Alamosa fire and emergency services. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Councilor Carson. Um, we are gonna have a few comments uh, Councilor Hensley. So I just want to thank you, Chief, for everything you do. Obviously, we have um, 
a lot of volunteers that obviously really support the fire department and take care of us uh, in our city. I um, also really like each year how there's a different theme and it does, it's actually something that makes me think about it. One of the messages I did take from this though is that maybe I should eat out more often. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, that idea there that um, it is something to really take into account and it's nice that every year we have something sort of that we think about each year. So thank you very much. You're welcome. We appreciate that. And I also want to thank you all for supporting this, reading this, reinforcing uh, this is something that nobody is immune to and also thanking you for your support of the fire department. So I want to thank you for everything you do, chief. Appreciate you. And we're going to come down and take a picture with you. Okay. Okay. Okay, that brings us to the next item on the agenda, consent calendar A. Councilor Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we approve consent calendar A. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Ms. Martinez. Councilor Vigil. Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, Historic Preservation Advisory Committee Annual Update. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, thank you so much for having me this evening. My name is Andrea Bachman and I am the Chair of the Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. So it's been a full year for us, um, but I come forward uh, to you tonight with a list of highlights. Um, so this year we welcome two new members, uh, a floating member from the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area. Julie Jacone is their executive director and she's been joining us for the last couple of meetings um, and has brought great fresh ideas to the board and we really appreciate her for that. And then we also welcomed Greg Wilson, the Electronic Resources and Discovery Librarian from Adams State, and his ability to find historic information so quickly and bring in books for us to read through. We also just really appreciate that about them, him, and just appreciate them both for, for joining us on the board. Uh, we want to thank you for signing the proclamation to designate the month of May as Historic Preservation Month. We celebrated with newspaper articles written by committee members and also um, social media posts put out by city staff members. The Valhagen clock, which you all might be familiar with, looks like it, um, is in motion to be installed shortly. Um, currently, they are working on, um, actually we just got photos of Beata from the city painting the clock, which was very exciting and is a testament to her hard work, um, both in the office and out on site. And so we've um, heard from folks in the community and project stakeholders that they would really like to see the clock placed on the north side of Main Street just by Cavley's. Um, so that's where we've decided to place it. Um, and we've received and secured the last bit of funding um, for electrifying the clock. So we'll keep you updated as to when this will be installed. But we're very excited about that. And it's been a long time coming. So earlier this year, the train depot or the Welcome Center as we know it uh, was designated as a local historic landmark. Um, and so previously it was on the state and national registry, but we're excited to have it um, locally designated. 
And additionally, last year, Zapata Park was designated as a local historic landmark, and the Maestas signage, which um, commemorates the landmark desegregation case in the valley, uh, was installed in partnership with the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area in the park. And we held a ribbon cutting in August um, and also celebrated the renaming of Zapata Park to Zapata Historic Park. Um, and lastly, before I leave you this evening, I just wanted to finish with a shout out to Rachel and Beata, who we really appreciate um, for leading or helping us lead our meetings and for all of their hard work and dedication, writing grants for us and, and making our projects come to life. So we appreciate them both and we appreciate you all for your continued support of HPAC. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna see if we have any comments from council. Councilor Daniel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Well, I just want to say thank you for all the work you do. The the work, it takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. And your committee has so much energy around this. And it's really, I am amazed by it every time you all come and talk about all of the things that you've done and all of the things that have been moving forward. And so it's just a really, it's really neat and valuable information for us. And I always find it very educational. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Daniel. Councilor uh, Griego. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. I just want to thank you and who else was responsible for taking history and putting it back into our downtown area, and that's that clock. Once that's erected back there, back up there, you're going to see the difference, you know, and to keep it in that general area, it's it's a real positive thing. So thank you so much, and thank you for all you do for the community in all these historical buildings and stuff, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Definitely a team effort. I also want to see if Council Vijo, if he had his hand raised or if you wanted to say anything, because I know sometimes he's involved with this um, committee as well. But just in case, Council Vijo, did you have any comments before we wrap things up? Thank you, Mayor. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm the liaison to that group and uh, just really appreciate the work that they do. Um, they're always looking for new buildings to get on the on the registry, the list, right? And that's a we know through data that that is an economic driver that uh, is a tourist attraction for people to go around to different towns and cities looking at their historic building list. So I I'm, I appreciate the work that the group does, always looking for new buildings and and houses to put on that list. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Council V Hill. You all have been extremely busy, uh, making a huge difference in our community, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to the next item on the agenda. Business brought forward by city staff, development services, the first reading of ordinance number 17-2023. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start with a presentation. It's a little unusual for a zone change, but I feel like there's some backstory to tonight's uh, zone change that we should go through. So this is the tract one of the Yon subdivision zone change request. So the first is a before and after map is the first slide. It shows that we're going the hatched property with the dotted line is going from industrial to campus is what we're proposing this evening. It's adjacent to the city's rather large uh, rec center complex. We can go to the next slide. So we're gonna cover first why we're changing the zoning. So we have jointly owned this lot with the county for very many years and the ownership was just resolved last month. So August 24th is when we finally officially split the ownership and it became solely the city's property. Um, we did have to do a subdivision to get to that point and we had to figure out some of the ownership and payment details because it was part of the FAA property and we had to pay fair market value. Luckily we were able to um, use the costs that had already been put into the airport. So it was costs already incurred because technically the city and county have owned that property for many, many years. So also we were prepared to include, oh, go back one line. Sorry. <laughs> so we did our mass rezone last year where we uh, rezoned about 10% of the city. And so this was one of the lots we talked about rezoning, but ultimately because it was still partially owned by the county, we decided to wait. We did change the rec center over to campus zoning and we can go over that in a moment in the next slide. 
So campus zoning, this is a very unique zoning category in our land use code. And it's one of the things where we have several large institutions in this community. So we have Adam State, we have the high school, we have the hospital complex, and they own many parcels of land. The city is also one of those organizations. And so we have many uses, we have many buildings, and we also have a lot of goals. And so campus master plan is really this excellent opportunity to be very intentional and plan for your future, for your growth and for your needs. We don't own very many vacant parcels. Really, there's just a handful and most of them are really tiny. And so this gives us an opportunity to really be intentional and really decide what the needs are of the community. And so it's a it's a large parcel, gives us the opportunity to build a new city shop. There's a proposed uh, move of the uh, soup kitchen, as we've discussed. So it takes it out of the residential area on State Street and moves it to an area closer to St. Benedict's. That's one of the proposals for this site. And then the final proposal is putting housing, which I think we all know housing is a pretty critical need in our community at this time. Um, this is the first campus master plan that's ever been done. So it's kind of wonderful. You'll see it um, at our next meeting on October 18th, but it gives sets the standard for future campus master plans on what we expect to see. And it really makes the city go first. So we say, this is our property. We're using it responsibly. We're not going to buy more land anytime soon. We're going to use the parcels that we have to meet the needs that we have for the community. So next. So I think it's, it's underlined here for emphasis, but I think it's come up several times this evening, but we are officially in a housing crisis. So the final reason that we're doing this zone change tonight is because there was an opportunity for funding. And so there's a $2.34 million grant that's associated with building this housing. So it builds us 18 housing units. And of the properties that the city owns, again, most of which are rather small, single family lot size, this was one where we had road access, we had utility access, and then we had access to a number of amenities that we thought would really be beneficial for this housing development. So whether it's the social services complex, it's a behavioral health complex, or it's the fact that uh, St. Benedict campsite is nearby, that was one of the many reasons that we chose this property. Next. So who is this housing for? I think there's a lot of misinformation in the community about who this housing is for. So first and foremost, we have our housing plan that was completed in 2021. And there were three special uh, populations that were identified, seniors, youth, and then those exiting homelessness or who were trying to keep out of homelessness. And so the goal was to build 20 to 40 units by 2026. This is half of that, is building these 18 units. Okay, so what does that mean? That sounds, that's kind of like mumbo jumbo from a plan, but it means that we're 155 rental units short. That means that only those that are the most competitive renters end up with a rental. That means you have stellar credit history. You have a long job history. That means that, you know, you're the first one in the door and you pay the application fee. And sometimes it's just dumb luck. <laughs> you can be a perfect applicant and you still might get chosen or not get chosen. So this means that so many people who are trying to achieve stable housing can't do it, even if they're employed. There's nothing for them to rent just because there's nothing out there. And so does this include people that potentially have substance abuse issues or mental health issues? Yes, but it also includes youth that are exiting the foster care system that are living on people's couches right now. There's a huge population of unhoused youth in our community. It also means those that have, you know, been evicted a couple times and nobody wants to rent to them again, or have had too many jobs over the last few years and they're just not stably employed. It also means those that would be exiting the justice system because those are not competitive people for housing. A landlord looks at the application, sees that they've been out of jail in the last few years, and they're definitely going to choose, you know, the new professor at the college that just moved to town and has a wife and a six-year-old and a four-year-old, like earlier this evening. Like, that's who you're going to rent to, obviously. <laughs> Um, so what this project does is it helps build credit history and rental history for those people. So this, this other thing, even though we're talking about it for people that are exiting homelessness or those that we're trying to keep out of homelessness, this is probably not appropriate housing for people that are out at St. Benedict now. So the people at St. Benedict now are not really ready for this type of stable housing. Many of them have jobs, but they're just um, chronically homeless. And it's in some ways, they're not ready to be in a housing situation. So that's why this project wasn't designed for the very bottom rung. So I, our city manager sort of mentions it all the time that we did not apply for the lowest um, entry level housing. This is a step above that. 
Um, I think I covered everything in this slide. So who are our um, project partners? The San Luis Valley Housing Coalition will be there. Um, they have to pay rent. There's definitely rent associated with these housing units. They will probably utilize the Section 8 housing vouchers, but they will also probably have incomes and have jobs. Um, they will have to apply. There will be a competitive application process. And so they'll have to have a background check. They'll have to have a credit check. And there will also be an on-site manager, and there will also be a code of conduct. And if you violate any of that, just like with any of the other housing coalition properties, you get evicted, just like any other property that the housing coalition manages. Um, the behavioral health group, they will provide wraparound services. They'll be um, helping them access services that are needed, whether or not it's substance abuse, mental health, employment, the type of services they provide already, but it'll be provided especially for residents of these housing units. Next, okay, why has construction already started? And I did steal this picture from Facebook. Um, <laughs> so we live above 7,500 feet. We have a really, really short construction season. If you're trying to pour concrete anywhere outside of you know, before April or bef after November, you're probably not going to have a successful pour. It's just not going to happen. We basically tell people after November, like, there's no point. You'll just have to repour it. Um, so we allow people all the time to do dirt work all season long because you don't need permits for dirt work. And that's technically what they're doing out at the site right now. But we also allow people all the time. And I say this as the head of the building department to start their construction, especially foundations. We'll separate the foundation permit from the building permit. The risk is you can go before the decision-making body, whether it's the planning commission or city council, and they can deny you. And you're just out the money that you've put in your property. And that's your risk. If you need to get started and you need to pour concrete before the season ends, and you're willing to lose all that money, that's your gamble. I don't want the building department to be the barrier. And city council has given us guidance for a long time to be as developer friendly as possible. And this is one of the ways that we can do it. So it's, it's a longstanding practice in the building department, but especially facing our housing crisis, we've gotten even more aggressive about letting people do this type of work. And so we have three different duplex projects all over town, three different owners had to do this without having their variance or their parking approved or their zoning approved. Um, we even had to do it for Iron Horse. Um, and ultimately, again, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't come back on the city. It, we told you what the risks were. Next, please. Okay, so what else are we doing to solve the housing crisis? I think you remember that we brought you about a thousand changes to our land use code. So um, trying as much as we can to remove development barriers, you know, increase density, allow different housing types, allow adaptive reuse, give people credit for building affordable housing, just every possible way that we can think of, we've gutted the land use code to make people to be able to build housing. We've also regulated short-term rentals, which took about six months and five work sessions and was not a pretty process, but it did protect housing stock. Um, we have a housing education campaign. We have a whole series of social media things that should be going out any day now. We have a whole section of our website that's just housing education. Um, and then we've also just partnered basically with every housing developer that will work with us um, and small scale. You know, Even if you're building a duplex, we try to figure out how to make it work for you so that it's still, you have to cover the capital gap. You have to cover the fact that you can't really sell things for enough to cover the cost of construction. So how can the city remove development barriers? How can you reach the goals in our housing plan? How can we help you achieve that? And how can we help you build housing? And so CRHDC is a project we talk about all the time. We just secured the $4.2 million for infrastructure, which is water and sewer and roads. Um, we've submitted another grant for 1.9 million. The city manager and I are on the agenda to talk to Dola and give a presentation. I heard it was a stellar application, which is exciting. Um, and then ultimately, although this funds the first 137 units, this four, or the 6.2 million, ultimately it's a it's a development of 400 units. It's a huge development. It'll provide housing for years, and it'll provide housing from people you know, that are stocking grocery store shelves all the way up to those that are making $72,000 a year, which I think we all know is an excellent job in Alamosa. Um, we're also working with the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition that again are going to manage this project on Airport Road. Um, we were successful in securing a $100,000 pre-development grant that they used to do the designs for Boyd. 
We also, city council voted to, actually you voted to supply up to a million dollars in short-term financing for them to purchase the Century Mobile Home Park. They ultimately only needed $60,000, but it was the difference between them buying the park. And what everybody forgets is that, you know, a mobile home park is your most affordable housing in your community. And then finally, we just outright paid for the $17,500 that's going to, um, for the engineering for the new wastewater system so that they can secure funding to actually build it to make that a better place to live. So, and these are pretty pictures of Tierra Azul because we never give up an opportunity to show you how pretty it is. And the fact that these are fully developed units, these are not conceptual renderings. There are architectural as built construction drawings for every one of these units and we could build them tomorrow if we had the money secured to do the infrastructure. So that was my impassioned speech about why housing matters and I will hand it over to my code expert to talk about zoning. So as I sometimes try to do, I try to bring some levity uh, to these conversations and it's kind of hard when you're just dealing with land use codes. So I'll try to make it as fun as possible but the nuts and bolts usually aren't. Um, Rachel gave a really good summary of kind of how we got to this point. So just to kind of recap, 2022, uh, we rezoned the Alamosa Family Rec Center to campus, you know, really essentially it's one thing that we, you know, should be following our own land use code. So that was one of the first ways to do that. Um, the city just became the sole owner of that one tract. And, and really, I mean, as soon as we became the owners, that's when the application uh, was submitted. Um, also, as, as Rachel mentioned, the AFRC property, this is really some of the only buildable property and, and you know, for multiple different uses, not just residential, but also for utility uses, for recreation uses. And, um, you know, one of the other important things is, so all rezonings have a, a very specific set of requirements that they have to meet. And the burden of proof is always on the applicant, whether it's the city is the applicant or somebody else. Um, and so those different standards in our land use code are historic resource protection and hazard mitigation. So are we rezoning something that's in the floodplain that somebody might build on? And then, you know, are we putting people at risk? Uh, the next one is, is there compatibility and public benefits? So really the way that that's measured is, is it documented in one of our plans? So in, in our comprehensive plan, is there a, a goal or a vision for this property or is it reflected in somewhere else like a downtown plan? So with this specific property, uh, it's in conformance with the, the comprehensive plan uh, because of the housing needs of the city and also the utility needs of the city with the sanitation uh, you know, structure that needs to be, <clears throat> needs to be moved. And then uh, there's four alternative standards. It's really kind of, you know, you have to meet at least one. Um, in our analysis, it meets uh, number two and number three. So it implements the vision of the comp comprehensive plan through providing specific city services. And then you know, there's a greater need for housing and zones that support housing than there is for industrial currently. And then since it is campus, it actually has one other extra requirement. It has to be under single ownership and it has to be at least 20 acres. And so uh, this specific tract is 13 acres and change, but the rest of it, it, uh, it ends up being like 67 acres. So checks that box as well. Um, on the back end of this, and, and this is something else that Rachel alluded to, uh, we have a campus master plan. It was it was in the Novus, but um, you know there's a lot of pretty pictures. It's not text heavy, so I hope you guys take some time and and review it between now and and um, October 18th. Really, when we look at the rec center as a whole, there's three primary uses. You've got utility uses, you've got recreation uses, and we've got the housing uses. So the housing certainly the most new. You know, kind of came out of the pandemic with the St. Benedict's camp, but we also have the rec center uses. I mean. Uh, doing the research for this campus master plan. I mean, you know, the rodeo grounds have been the rodeo grounds since the early 1900s. And it's really fun. You know, you read these old articles. Hey, you know, there's a fair at the rodeo grounds. They never tell you where the rodeo grounds are, uh, which is a little bit frustrating to try to come up with some, you know, some back history. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things about campuses is it, it allows for flexibility, but also integration of different uses to kind of fulfill the needs that only a larger institution can do, such as Adam State, such as a hospital, or such as the city of Alamosa. And with us being the first in the door, we certainly wanted to do 
really thorough job of documenting all of this and, and trying to set a good standard. So um, again, there's a lot of nice, pretty pictures. Hope you guys enjoy it. But you know, if you're not feeling, uh, if you're feeling a little stir crazy, this might help put you to sleep too. So um, one other thing, uh, we did receive a unanimous recommendation from our planning commission. I always want to point out when we've got one of our planning commissioners here, uh, we actually had two earlier. Um, they certainly put a lot of work into reviewing all these documents and, you know, really make sure that, you know, all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. So um, at the next meeting, that's when we'll talk about the campus master plan in more detail, but really the first step is the rezoning to campus. Thank you, Will Silver. Thank you for that uh, great presentation. Council Carson um, has some comments. Um, so one of the things that are, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So the PowerPoint that you just did is on the website. Is that correct? It, it should be and possibly given out on social media so that people could go through it and actually read through it, have a chance because trying to read it and pay attention to it up here is a little tough. So let's make sure and do that um, and try to mitigate some of that, uh, you know, that misinformation. And, and, you know, from my standpoint, I did a ton of research before ever even pitching the idea of St. Benedict's or any of that stuff. And I own a lot of that stuff because I, I had to dig to figure out what to do. Denver had, Denver had been sued successfully over 20 times at that point because they had nowhere for their homeless, homeless population to go. So their PD couldn't even do anything. I mean, I know we hear stories all the time now about, you know, PD letting people slide with this or that and because the changes in the law. But without this camp, as a first step, we couldn't do anything. You know what I mean? At all. They could camp all day in front of the green spot or all day in front of everybody's house. One of the first people that called me to, to um, pulled me to, to city council was Donna Wood. She lived right there and she had huge issues with the homeless population there. And Judy, I've talked to Judy for a long time. One of my first goals when I got on council was to move the soup kitchen and we're moving towards that goal. It had been there for 30 years plus. It took us 30 years to get there. And in a few years, we've made huge strides. So as negative as it looks in the public eye, I always welcome ideas. I, I always welcome people to come talk to us. And, and you know, if we're doing wrong or we're, we're, you know, doing things that the community doesn't like, the community is always welcome to come here and contribute to those ideas. We welcome that. So please do that. Um, and, you know, we just ask for the support because it's hard and it ain't going anywhere. I've said it before. The homeless population is not going to get smaller and not because we're busing them in or, or recruiting homeless people. That's everywhere. Drive down, uh, you know, Academy or, or Nevada and Springs and look at the pavilions there. On any day of the week at noon, there's 40, 50, 100, 200 homeless people hanging out there. And so we're doing what we can now to be proactive because believe it or not, we're 10 years ahead of the rest of the state in most respects. So as hard as it is for, for you know, for the public to swallow, we're, we're doing the best. We're doing the best, not that we, not only that we can, but we're ahead. We're ahead of the game. And again, I commend Ruthie. She's here every week, putting in time, just like we are. So I, I really do commend you and I respect your ideas and your input. So we need more people like that. We need more people showing up and, and contributing and giving us their opinion. That's just the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carson. I'm not for sure who's like him. Okay, Councillor Griego and then okay. Councillor Daniel. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. We've had we've had homelessness here for years and years. And nobody's ever tried to help the homeless. They stuck them. If you're familiar with Alamos, there was an area called the Devil's Place. These people lived there and, and hardship and hardship. Finally, people cried about the problem there and they pulled all those people out of there. But we're dealing with human beings that that have lived here. 80% of the people that are homeless that are at, at Benedict's are from here. They're not from they're not from Denver. They're not from all over. They're they've gone through hard times. And some of those people want to get out of it. Want to get out to, to live out there, especially now that we have women out there. I think we got 10 women that are living out there. And it's a hardship, and they want to get out. 
but I, I've even tried myself to try to get some of those people rent a uh, rent somewhere and you go down there and you talk to people and they say, well, let's do a background check. No, we don't want those kind of people here. We don't want, well, how are these people going to get out of that hole if we don't give them an opportunity? And when we finally got this funding for this kind of housing, you know, to give these people a step to get up, you don't want to live in a, a, a hole like that all your life. And now to, to give them a chance to get out. And this is just a, a, live there for a while and then move on, get your credit back up again and get your life going back again. You know, nobody likes to live that kind of life. And I, I really appreciate our staff and, and the, whoever's put together this to give these people an opportunity to, to make something out of their lives. And like I said, we're going to, we're going to have homeless all the time, you know, and we're very fortunate that we reacted right away or else we would have like what Denver and all these big cities where you have, homeless parked everywhere, you know, and we're trying as much, you know, we try to do something and I'm sure that you can't please everybody out there, but at least we're trying to, to, to work with people and with human beings and stuff. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Garrigo. Uh, Councilor Daniel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. You're um, I want to say thank you to my fellow counselors for things that, that you've said. I think we've learned a lot on this journey and I think the journey has been challenging. I think the places where we have to remember why it looks funny to our community and why things seem to be happening in a way is that if we had been already disentangled from the county, this would have been zoned campus anyway. And so, yes, we've been talking about planning and we've been talking about these opportunities for housing. This just is a victim of timing for this rezoning. So I want to be real about that with our, our public constituents because the campus zoning would have happened before and then we still would have had the conversation about the housing needs. So, so they both would have happened, but they're just now happening at the same time where they wouldn't have if, the, if we had been able to disentangle sooner. The other thing that I think is really important is there is a lot of judgment and a lot of anger around things that people, we as community members, don't have control over for other folks. Like we can't force someone to do something because we think it is the right thing for them to do. And what we can do and what we have control over is allowing people to have opportunities that maybe they don't have in the ways that they have been raised and the ways that they have been learned and the things that have happened to them and yes, choices that they have made as well. Both of those things are true. And this type of housing that we are talking about for these members of our community, and I've gotten to work with people who are experiencing homelessness for lots of different reasons. I've gotten to work with people who are exiting the criminal justice system. I've gotten to work with people who have substance use issues and mental health concerns and working with youth who are exiting the foster care system. I've been very fortunate to work with all of them. And the thing that I have to say about those populations is the fact that they have made it to the conversations we are having with them is a huge win. And we have to be able to give them opportunities to be in this housing and to try things to build up because if we don't, don't, the only thing we're doing as a system is holding them down and then continuing to complain about the burden they have on our system. So this housing is highly controversial and the things that we're doing are very difficult. And if we don't embrace this as a community and make a community effort, nothing is going to change. And we know that's not okay either. Thank you, Council Daniel. Council Carson. Thank you, Councilor Daniel. That's you know you're you're right on point there. Um, I just had one question. Can you uh, give us a breakdown? Just email us a breakdown of what the 137 units are going to be like. How many are multifamily? How many are two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom? Just so that we can put that information out there, and people may start getting excited. You know, you might start getting people approaching CRHDC already because um, they're needed houses. 137 houses is going to fill a lot of gap. But yeah, and also please get this uh, PowerPoint on the website and on Facebook so that people can access it. Thank you, Councillor Carson, and I appreciate that um, that direction. I think to to add a little bit is some of the frustration I sense from a community perspective, and and there's different types, so this isn't intended to be all inclusive. Is is you know comments of 
why do you have to break the law or why are you homeless in order for the city to try to do something? And I think the point you're trying to raise and that we were trying to raise tonight as well with, with, with Rachel's presentation is this is just one piece of what we're trying to do. It's a very targeted, someone else um, used the word niche um, type of situation. But when you look at the CRHDC in those 137 units, when you look at Boyd and it's not the city doing it, all we're doing is writing grants and trying to funnel money to our housing partners. Um, but there is a lot of effort trying to help a full range of our community because we know there's a crisis. Um, and so this just happens to be an area that even those projects are not necessarily going to address either. And so I think getting more information on those 137 units would be very educational. Okay, and uh, I would like to recognize Councillor uh, Vigil, who has his hand raised. Go ahead, Councillor Vigil. Thank you, Mayor. And I just want to uh, thank the, the council and everybody in the public tonight for letting me be on Zoom tonight. Uh, my wife is out of town and we don't have a babysitter, so I'm on daddy duty and, and trying to be a city councilor at the same time. Um, so I have also had, I've received some comments and some phone calls and folk and that from folks um, about what's going on down there. Uh, by the the rodeo grounds, um, and I, you you addressed it in you addressed it in the presentation, uh, Rachel. But can you please just really quick go over again? Uh, because like we had, I had some comments of why is dirt being moved, and it, and and nothing has been set in stone yet, or or the did did the rezoning happen? You know, I I feel I feel like if we could be uber transparent about that process, that's only gonna help those concerns from some of the folks out there. Can you please go over that again? Absolutely. So we don't require any permits for moving dirt. So you can move dirt all day long and we won't stop you. Don't mess with Harry's utilities, he'll get mad at you. But beyond that, you can move dirt. There's no permit for that. Um, beyond that, this is a relatively common practice that we do towards the end of the building season. And that is that you are going to run out of time to pour concrete and we understand that but you're oftentimes constrained by either, it's usually a parking variance is often what it was, is, but it's also sometimes a zone change. There's some nuance in the code, which means that you don't quite fit the letter of the law and you have to go before a decision-making body. And so it's a long standing practice of the building department long before I was in charge of it, where if you get to that part of the season and you can build, you can do your framing, you can do your finish work, you can do all your interior work, you can do roofing, you can do all of the rest of the work after it gets cold. It's uncomfortable, but you can work through the winter. You cannot pour concrete after October. You really can't. And so, and if you get an early freeze in October, you can't do it then either. And so we got to the point with this property where we hadn't disentangled the ownership, which is a, a fault of you know, probably mine actually, but <laughs> it just hadn't been disentangled and we weren't ready to do the zone change. And so we got to the point where we said, you're going to run out of time to pour foundations. So you can move forward with the dirt work and you can pour foundations, but it's not a thing that we just did for the city. So we did it for Iron Horse. We've done it for James Sue. We've done it for a handful of developers all over the city where we do not want to delay you an entire building season because you can't pour a foundation now. And foundations are expensive, but they're not, you know, they won't bankrupt you. So worst case scenario, you go through this process, you do your dirt work, you pour your foundation and you get denied and you're out those costs. You lose that money, but it was as a developer, sometimes when you're trying to get those houses market ready, it's a gamble you're willing to take. And we respect that. And again, as much as possible, we try to be developer friendly. And we know that more than anything else, really in the building department right now, we're trying to get housing units ready. And whatever we can do to make that happen, we will. So even now, it's more true than it's ever been. But it's always been true of the building department at the city. If you get to the end of the season and you need to pour a foundation, we will let you pull a separate permit for your foundations and we'll let you do that work before the ground freezes hard. And I want to just add, um, Councillor Hill. you know, we've said it, but I just want to, I guess, say it in my own way, is we don't like the optics. And when we were realizing how this schedule was going to line up, um, the city attorney, myself, and, and Rachel had a very hard conversation of we can't treat ourselves differently. Do we allow this? And that's when Rachel explained what she just explained to you to us, because we wanted to make sure we were holding ourselves to the same standard. 
The other thing that complicates this is, you know, clearly if this wasn't grant funded with grant deadlines, we could have just waited to start construction um, in April type of situation. But unfortunately, this is grant funded with an extremely tight time frame um, for us to meet those deadlines. So you you have this delayed untangling, which took away time in the beginning and, and didn't allow us to include it with the rezoning. Um, and then you couple that with the grant, then it doesn't allow us to, to really wait either. So we, we decided to treat ourselves like we do other developers and do the groundwork and the foundation hoping that we would get approval. Okay, okay. Councilor Beal, hand is still, still raised. Go ahead, Councilor. And and then um, another comment I have is, um, I think with the, with the development of the Iron Horse, um, we all know there's been some issues out there. The police have been called out there quite a bit. And and so I think those those have brought some anxiety and some, some frustration to the community. Um, Rachel, could you just again for full transparency, can you um communicate again to the folks about how the different there's different processes and order and there's things in line um for for lack of a better term, uh good behavior and and doing what you're supposed to do out there. And if you don't, you may get kicked out. Can you go over that again? And Rachel, before you do that, I want to just address the first part, which is the iron horse. And um you know, we had, there was concerns when it was being built, but I think some of those concerns were based more on perceptions and biases. Unfortunately, um, once it was up and operating, some of how they were operating reinforced what those concerns were. And we have to be very honest about that. The police department and our chief has worked closely with them to go, to try to get that fixed. And, and part of that included um, a change in on-site management um, to be able to work more closely to address some of the issues. And it also included doing better background checks type of situation. And so those were some of the key parts. We are planning on running the numbers again for Iron Horse. Um, what we are hearing anecdotally is that there has been a difference um, and that there has been improvement, but that's just anecdotal. So we do want to run the police numbers again because that's what we were looking at previously. So with that history on Iron Horse, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you to talk about how this will be managed. The reason that we chose the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition is because they run such a tight ship because they run things like the Century Mobile Home Park and they are renting the most affordable housing units in our community. And so they deal with a clientele that's a little bit closer to the clientele we're trying to reach in this housing development, but also they're property managers. You know, they may not be like, they're not a property management company that does market rate housing because they use affordable housing and they use the voucher system and they have um, accessible housing, ADA housing. They have, uh, they have different bars and different uh, median incomes that they're trying to hit with their population. So they serve a specialty population. Um, but at the same time, you get evicted if you misbehave in their properties and they run very thorough background checks. So they don't have the criteria in place yet. She's working closely with Don Melgar as their executive director is working closely with her attorney to make sure that they can develop a criteria for applicants that again, allows this population that really can't be housed anywhere else into these units, but at the same time is, you know, not letting just anyone in and also not discriminatory. So she has to walk just a razor fine edge to make sure that she's getting a population in these units that can be stably housed, that are stable enough and functional enough to live in this housing so they can be successful ultimately. The goal is for people to be there a year or two. Obviously they're not getting kicked out if they don't make it, but it's, there are not necessarily benchmarks, but they, they do have to keep making progress towards affordable housing. And so that's the whole goal of what she's doing. And if you break the rules or if you don't qualify and you're not a person that can be stably housed, you're not going to end up in these housing units to begin with. And if you break the rules, there's an on-site manager 24 seven that lives in one of the two bedroom units. You will be evicted. It's a real housing development. It just happened to be grant funded on land owned by the city. Thank you, Rachel. And then, so, I just really, I, I really appreciate the comments from the fellow counselors tonight, Christina Daniel, Mike Carson, and uh, Mr. Grego. Uh, we've, we've known this issue has been coming up for quite a while now, and we 
our city has done, and this was mentioned earlier in the meeting, our city has done a lot to address the housing crisis. We've limited the number of short-term rentals. We've uh, allowed, um, it, we've made it easier for people to try to use uh, like um, garages and other out, uh, buildings on their property to become um, other types of housing for people. We have, uh, we did the CRHDC, Tierra Azul, that's going to be a great development. Like this is another, this is just another way to attack the housing crisis. And I support it hundred percent. I do, I do hope though, that the city, like I, I would also urge, uh, I really like uh, Michael Carson's idea of getting this PowerPoint on the website. Um, I would also ask, can we go down there and meet with the immediate neighbors of this area? I know of, uh, of, a, of a couple who lives right across the street who are very fired up about this, who don't want it there. But if we made a, an attempt to just talk to them and tell them what's going to come and the process and, 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 the, and the strict guidelines and rules that are coming there, I think that might help with, with some anxiety that's there. And those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Council V. Hill. Councilor Daniel. I'm not sure if there were any other comments. I was prepared to make a motion. Yeah, I was going to wrap okay. it up and then um, make, yes. May I make one comment Ms. for Councilor V. Hill? We did speak with the neighbors. So they were at the planning commission hearing and we did let them have a dialogue with staff, which is a little of, bit of an unorthodox setup for a planning commission meeting, but it was a small audience. And I think we had a really good conversation with them. Um, I'm not good at direct quotes, but basically she said, my questions are answered. I don't have any opposition to this project and I'm going home because I have school tomorrow. Um, I know that evolved later on social media, but she did she did have her questions answers and she did seem happy at the planning commission. And it's so much so that we even had a planning commission member come to our office yesterday and or the day after and congratulate us for really taking the time and going an unorthodox route through our meeting to really satisfy their concerns. But to Councilor Vigil, we can reach out again to to the individuals. Please, please do. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. All right. And then I'll just wrap things up. I, I'm very proud to uh, be a part of uh, the council as well as the staff who are really thoughtful and really considerate when it comes to addressing our housing crisis to make sure that we include all people in the conversations and also listen um, not with listening to respond, but listening to provide solid information. Um, the easiest thing to do as a council person, as staff, is to do nothing when it comes to the housing crisis. And when you do nothing, it's just like remaining stagnant. And when you remain stagnant in a community, you lose time. And everybody up here today have talked about the shortage that we have in housing and when we can't afford and we don't have the time to continue to do nothing. We have to do something. So I'm really thankful for the information that staff provided tonight to shed light on the darkness that spread on social media sometime um, so that people will see that we are grounded in truth. We're not trying to spread any misinformation. We're not trying to force anything on anyone against anyone's will. And we're always willing to listen to find common ground for the greater good of all of our citizens in this community. So thank you all so very much for your efforts. I agree with Council Carson. Let's put this on uh, our social media so we're more proactive and then people have access to the facts so that it will shed light on the darkness that's out there. Okay, Ms. Daniel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, if there's no further comment, I move that we approve on first reading ordinance number 17-2023, and we set it for a public hearing um, at our next meeting, which is October 18th at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter can be heard. Second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Councilor Vigil? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda under finance, first reading of ordinance number 18, 2023. 
Thank you, Council. Um, so I will be doing a PowerPoint presentation. I'll also be repeating this when we have our public hearing. Um, I think it's just important for such an important document that guides our entire next year and our priorities that we spend a little bit of time of what does this budget look like. This is the presentation that we're doing from a staff perspective that will also cover the next two ordinances because the pay plan and the utility rates are obviously tied into the annual budget. So um, you can just take my time and divide it by three, I guess, from a appropriability situation. Bless you. Um, so just to start off with the, the city's mission statement and vision statement, um, we will be providing a compassionate, welcoming, and collaborative environment for our residents, visitors, and businesses. We want to be a driver of business-friendly economic development while valuing and embracing our rich heritage and history of ethnic and cultural diversity. Here is the city organizational chart. Um, We've got a lot of departments, um, and I like to start here because when we start talking about enterprise fund and, and, and rec fund and general fund, these funds have to cover everything that the city provides, which includes police, human resources, finance, IT, public works, which is street, water, sewer, parks and recreation, the library, um, economic development, fire operations, development services, municipal court, the city clerk, um, not to mention myself and the city attorney. The focus areas actually this year are the same as they are in 2023. How do we determine these? We take a look at kind of what the biggest capital projects are, what some of the bigger investments we're doing in the budget. And so to no surprise, um, housing is remaining as one of our top um, areas that we're focusing on. Public safety, both with police, when we're looking at lead, the co-responder, um, making sure we're able to attract and retain our police officers. And from a fire perspective, taking a look at, do we have the right structure? Does there need to be some changes? Some things like that. Infrastructure is always towards the top as well. It's our most expensive one, probably, um, especially as it relates to our enterprise fund. Um, when you have to meet requirements and you have an aging infrastructure, um, it's always going to be something where there's a lot of funds that, that need to be appropriated. Economic development is a priority for our community. Um, Kathy works with existing businesses, not only to help make sure that they're strong, that they have their needs met, but if they're expanding, how can we help them? But then also to attract employers to our community and make sure they land in the right location. And then outdoor recreation, which honestly used to be towards the top. It's just old school now, I guess. Um, they're just providing the same old, same old, other than the giant bridge and growing the trails and, and looking at um, access from an equity perspective and the riverfront access. So even though there's a lot going on there, um, they're still getting pushed out a little bit um, from these other types of priorities that aren't as easy maybe to fix and can be a little more complicated as well. From a budget overview, it's important to think of it almost as buckets. So when you see the word funds, sometimes I just would like to replace it with the word bucket. So the general fund has money that goes into it, and then that can be used on, on certain expenses. The enterprise fund, which is our water, sewer, and sanitation, has dedicated funding that goes in that can only be used for those services. The street trust fund, again, has dedicated funding that can only be used on those streets that were identified. And our community recreation fund has the dedicated sales tax that can only be used on certain services as well. We also have smaller funds that you can see listed there. We've got a large budget coming up for 2024. From a revenue perspective, we are expecting about $40 million. So that's that's a lot of funding to go to some different areas. You can see that the general fund um, is bringing in a little over half of that. Enterprise is about 21%. And then you can see some of those other funds bringing in the rest of the pie chart there. 
expenditures, you are saying that number correctly. We are spending about 2.7 million more dollars than we are bringing in. And some of these were planned. Um, we've got some of these major construction projects, they're grant funded. Um, we've got the purchasing of the water rights to close out some of those items for storage. So there, there's these, these projects that we knew couldn't happen right away and that they're going to be hitting in, in 2024. So um, sometimes when we get asked why our fund balance might be the way it is, it's because we know some of these projects are coming up. So we will have a budget that shows expenditures of 42, almost $43 million. So the general fund is the one that gets stretched the most. Um, it is used to pay for police, fire, park maintenance, street maintenance, a portion of the library. It pays for court and then overall administration. Public safety and street maintenance represent the largest percentage of the general fund. We get this primarily from a sales tax and we get about 570,000 in property taxes. So for the general fund, um, those taxes bring in about 51%. We got intergovernmental um, revenue, which is um, transfers or um, grants. So you can see there's a significant amount of grants. And then you can see some of the other charges for services, license for permits, those types of things. From a expenditure, we're looking at spending about 21 million. Development services is artificially inflated because the um, Hunt Agricultural Trail, the reconstruction of Hunt Avenue is partially located in there. That is not normal. Usually they're one of the skinny little slivers that you would see. Um, but you can see, you know, we've got police operations, street maintenance, there's a few other public safety, and then all the other smaller departments, you can see their, their slice of the pie. The enterprise fund, as I indicated earlier, is our water, wastewater, and sanitation. A majority of these monies that fund for this um, enterprise fund is the rates that we charge from a utility rate. The charges for services cover actually just 66%. Um, transfers in um, and grants um, cover the other part, as well as miscellaneous revenue and net investments. So transfers in would be um, the 1.3 from the sales tax that can help offset some of these costs, as well as um, from the capital improvement fund. The intergovernmental revenue would be the grants and those types of items. So the enterprise fund expenditures is over 10 million. Um, of the expenditures, 55% are on capital expenditures. And so that's what I'm talking about. When we look at our utilities and, and how many water lines we have and sewer lines and those lift stations, we've got 23 lift stations that can cost sometimes almost up to 500,000. So the, the, there's a lot of infrastructure. We've got an aging wastewater treatment plant and you know the chemicals for both plants to, to treat is, is pretty expensive. Um, you can see then the operational costs are, are much smaller in the enterprise fund. The street trust fund, this is something that we want to make sure there's as much transparency as possible because this was our promise to the community. It's a dedicated half cent sales tax that has to go towards those streets that were approved in the resolution. Additionally, we committed to transferring 500000 every year from the general fund in order to pay for these projects. So that pie chart is, has two different revenue sources, the 500,000 from the general fund and then the tax revenue. And then here's the projects. We've got Washington Avenue, Tremont to West 8th, um, Pike Avenue, West 6th Street, which is probably just a design, La Vida, which is just, um, is in there. So Pike Avenue is probably just the design for 76,000. Then we've got the unassigned maintenance. So that's the overlay. And then we've got the concrete replacement. Community recreation, 
that funds um, the Alamosa Library, the golf operations, the Alamosa Family Recreation Center, ice rink, multi-purpose facility, trails, numerous team sports, outdoor and indoor recreational activities. They get a lot done with that half cent sales tax. Um, as taxes represent almost 60%. From a revenue perspective, golf course is definitely holding its own um, by making sure they're bringing in appropriate revenue to cover expenses. And then you can see the other types of revenue that come in. Charges for services is fairly minimal. Community recreation from an expenditure, the 63% um, goes to community recreation, 21% to golf course and library gets about 15%. Capital improvement. So our 2024 budget, we are almost spending $12 million in capital um, projects. And I think that's a really big deal. Um, that Some of it is the purchase of vehicles. Some of it is um, making needed improvements to facilities. But it also is some outward facing projects that impact the community that are very tangible projects. And so there is a lot going on. You'll see development services sticking out a little bit there with the 2.5. Um, but you've got public works, sewer, street, um, water department. So a lot of our utilities are the major drivers of the, the capital improvement plan, but that's almost $12 million of capital projects in just one year that's expected for 2024. We also work really hard to try to stretch the funding um, that comes in by going after grants. And I just, I, staff is just amazing on how they're juggling everything they are. You can see the dramatic growth that we've, We've had 2015 was about 200, it's almost 300,000. In 2023, we had $17 million in grants. That's just enormous. Um, and it takes a lot of work to apply for them, but it also takes even more work to manage them and make sure that we are doing everything we can as a fiscal agent so we're still competitive for future grants. And so this is a lot of, work that, that's gone into it. I think sometimes our public, they just focus a lot on, are we spending this on the downtown or what are we doing for grants from a homeless perspective? So that's why we wanted to actually do the 2023 breakdown. If you look at the grants, 38% has gone towards housing, 31% has gone towards parks and recreation, Yes, downtown has 15%, but 1 million of that is for the demolition of the Walsh Hotel. So if it wasn't for that, they'd be closer to um, the public safety and infrastructure numbers from a grant perspective. Homeless is about 1% um, as it relates to what grants we've gone after and been successful in achieving. Miscellaneous, so IT, historic preservation, represent less than 1%. So I think from an educational perspective, that's valuable information. So as we get into more specifically the, the budget that's before you tonight, some of the higher, not as high level as what we just covered, but next level down, we are expecting sales tax revenue to increase at about 4%. Staff is recommending the standard compensation increase of 4% COLA based on the five-year CPI average and a pay for performance increase that ranges from zero to 4% based on the employee performance. So this is what is um, normal from what the, the city does. Additionally, and I'll get into this with a little more detail, we feel that we need to correct the pay plan um, and we've figured out how to, to afford about 7%. So that still allows us to do $12 million in capital projects, as well as achieve some other key things that I'm gonna review here without having to balance the budget on the employees' backs. The healthcare costs are increasing by about 9.18%. We are finally seeing our investment revenue go back up. This is probably one of the areas we got hit hardest during COVID, which I guess shouldn't have been a surprise. We were expecting though the sales tax, which didn't end up being where we got hit. Um, but our investment revenue is going back up. However, we do expect some increases in jail fees. Um, we are expecting increases in our property casualty and liability insurance. 
We have been able to tuck away 200,000 for our future levy needs as that construction project gets closer. And we also were able to add a part-time parks maintenance personnel. Um, we need to be able to focus more on our parks and part of that includes locking and unlocking our bathrooms and trying to do more to reduce the vandalism and damage that we're seeing in our parks. The 10 year plan also supports sustaining our co-responder program, which I think is very important. And from the general fund, this is, um, we will have a $3.6 million CIP. So I know we've gotten questions um, and we've talked about it a lot at the budget work session um, as it relates to staff's recommendation on employee compensation. So I just wanna be addressing that um, up front. One of the items that sometimes gets at, um, brought up is that we just added two holidays. Um, and what I always like to, to indicate during this time is yes, employees very much benefit getting two more holidays. No one's going to say anything other than that. Um, but this was holidays that were added at the discretion of city council. As city council reviewed the array of holidays that we had, they felt that our holidays that recognize the role of, of African Americans in our society was lacking. We didn't have Martin Luther King and we didn't have Juneteenth. And so that was something that council felt was important to be reflective of, of a value um, for our community. So that isn't something we, we asked employees about. We didn't ask them, would you like holidays compared to pay? If you want holidays, which ones do you want? It was something that was a discussion at the city council level. The other item that sometimes gets brought up is that we just went to a 410 schedule. It's important to note that that decision was related to city hall. And the only reason city council was voting on that is because we were actually looking to change our hours as it relates to the public. So we have had some other departments that um, aren't front facing. And so for example, our streets department has done a 410 schedule during the um, construction seasons that they have found to, to be extremely helpful. But regardless of what was voted on and that was for just city hall, the recent vote, employees are still working 40 hours. Um, they're not working less than 40 hours. They're not getting some sort of deal or anything like that. There's benefits for the employees, um, especially for those that, that maybe don't live here in Alamosa and, and are driving in. There's benefits for those that maybe pay for childcare or who have students in the school district and, and those types of things, but they're still working 40 hours. It's just four days instead of five. However, a lot of what is driving the recommendation to council is based on how we set our pay to begin with. And so in 2021, we did a market survey. It's important to do a market survey probably every three to five years. Um, I like to be more on the five year because they're not cheap and they can cause disruption in your organization. Um, but it's important to understand what the market is and, and how the market survey works is you identify what are your comparable organizations and then you identify where you want the salaries to fall and where the city has always identified where they want the salaries to fall is at 50%. I think what our philosophy has been is that is the most responsible as a steward of taxpayer dollars, that we shouldn't be paying more than what 50% of the market is. But we also need to be able to attract and retain employees to provide a certain level of service to our community, which means we don't want to be below that 50% because then it makes that much more challenging. And you start to see costs to turnover and you start to see breaks in service and, and those types of things. So our goal has always been to be at 50%. So that means half of the organizations are paying more than us and half are paying less than us. What we have realized is that we have fallen further behind in our where we need to be on 50% above and 50% below, and we need to do a correction. If we don't, we will be that much further behind the next time we do a survey and then need to get caught up. 
I touched on this, but if you're not paying at least 50%, it becomes very challenging to attract and retain employees. And we were seeing that with vacancies and with turnover. And there is very much a cost to that. Additionally, you know, as we're talking on the grants and, and those types of things, Part of the reason we're able to go after the grants at the rate we're able to and at the magnitude we're able to is because we've got very competent employees doing their jobs. And if we start to mess with that, that's one of the first areas that could get impacted is then we're having to pull employees away from grants, getting into other types of areas and, and those types of things. But there's... There's nothing that replaces an employee that has 5, 10, 15 years of knowledge and how efficient and how good they can be at that job. If they leave, we lose that. We lose that investment. And there's a cost to that as well. The other items that we've been seeing is that the dramatic increases in state minimum wage, which pushes up against our pay plan as well. So 2023 um, was increased by 8.68. 2024 is going to increase by 6%. The five-year average is about a 6.05%. And then finally, we budgeted too conservatively in 2023. Pay for performance was lowered to only be up to 3% instead of our regular 4%. And we didn't think we could afford a COLA of more than 2% when it should have been 4.32%. The enterprise fund budget, some of the major items, we are recommending a utility rate increase of 5% for water, sewer, and sanitation. We are seeing a $20,000 decrease in recycling revenue. We had to add 50,000 for the lead and copper requirements that are coming out. Again, this is an expensive service to provide. We are seeing increases in landfill fees of about 16,000 and another 17,000 at the wastewater treatment plant increase for electrical and gas services. And we have about 5.9 million in the CIP. So obviously, I think probably the, the hardest item that's recommended in the budget is a utility rate increase. Um, we realize the demographics of our community and that a lot of individuals are struggling. And so this is not something that city staff takes lightly. Um, but I think it's important to make sure we add perspective of what increases have been historically. Um, that these are in line and in some cases lower um, than what some years have been. And then if you look at what a 5% means for each of these on a residential user of about 8,000 gallons a month, that total increase um, for next year would be $4.26. And so again, um, it's not something that we we make it lightly, but the cost for construction, the cost for vehicles, the cost for chemicals, there's the, there's never probably going to be a year that it's going to be zero percent. The other value of this this document in front of you is to show you how we compare to the average of other communities. And you can see that there's a pretty significant difference. Part of that difference is because we do rely on the excess funds from that sales tax from the water treatment plant. If we did not have those excess funds, these rates would have to be higher type of situation. And with that, I am available for any questions from council. Very informative uh, presentation, Ms. Sanchez. Um, I have some lights lit up. I'll start off with uh, Councillor Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. I wanted to say thank you for this presentation. I think this is a very easy way to read this. Um, and I just wanted to let the public know we've now been talking about the budget for several work sessions. We may still have questions. Um, but if we don't have a lot of questions before we talk about it, we've heard this several times. And so um, I really appreciate how it was presented, though, in the um, PowerPoint format and the different ways it was, it was designed. So I just really want to say thank you. I didn't have a direct question, but also wanted to assure the public that we've been working with these numbers for quite a bit. And I think if I could just jump in, Mayor, um, fielding some of the questions, especially from the press, um, is, you know, 
what kind of questions would they expect and those types of things. I really want to make it clear that the, those work sessions have had a lot of debate and that there was times council was pushing back on ideas and staff took that pushback and went and made changes to the budget and, and that's what's presented to you tonight. And so I think that's really important from a public perception perspective is there's been two other work sessions where there's been quite lengthy debate about the budget. Okay, um, I don't see any other uh, lights on, but we want to thank you for sharing all this, uh, Ms. Sanchez. And once again, this is just another thing that we use to be transparent in our community to make sure that everyone is hearing the truth and not misinformation. Okay, Councilor Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. I move that we approve on first reading ordinance number 18-2023, and we set it for a public hearing on October 18th at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Councilor Vigil? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to the next item under finance, the first reading of ordinance number 19, 2023. So mayor, as promised, I have nothing further to say on this ordinance. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to council for any comments or motion. So I, I just wanted to add that this was one of the things that we did debate in a work session. And I think that it was uh, very well um, taken. And the fact that the rate is what we agreed, like what came out of that meeting, I really appreciate staff um, doing that. And so I don't see any other comments. So um, I would move that we approve ordinance number 19, 2023 on first reading and set it for public hearing on October 18th at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, please start voting. Councilor Vigil? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. That brings us down to human resources. Um, first reading of ordinance number 2023 and ordinance amending the established pay plan for the city officers and employees in accordance to Article 3, Section 11 of the Charter. Again, I did the one presentation, so I have nothing further to say. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Uh, Councilor Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. I do have something to say about this because I do think this came up in the public comment and I want to address it because I think it goes back to what um, Heather was saying regarding the kinds of employees we want to keep and retain and also acknowledging that it is very difficult to run a business in any city or town um, and that there are going to be struggles, especially with the wage increases of minimum wage and all of that continuing to put pressure on how um, folks can manage their employees. I do believe that we deserve as the city of Alamosa and all of our residents, the best employees we can afford with the most responsible pay plan. I think that we have been able to manage that with these increases that we are talking about to attract and retain appropriate staff. This is happening in all of the staff in all of the organizations I work with. The, the needs of our, um, the people we're trying to hire are butting up against the budgets we have and how are we going to do this and what makes sense in our current climate. And in order to keep and maintain the staff that we have, I think this is a necessary adjustment to the pay plan. Um, and I am very supportive of, of the pay plan that has been presented. Although I know it feels like a big jump for our community, I think it is an appropriate jump for our, our staff. Thank you, uh, Councillor Daniel. I will move that we approve on first reading ordinance number 20-2023 and set it for a public hearing on October 18th at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. I'll second. And I do echo what Councilor Daniel said as well. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, on further discussion, our, our greatest asset as council, as, as a team, are people. 
we're only as good as the people who work on our team and serve on our team. And I'm just really proud and honored that we really show how much we appreciate them, not only verbally, but also financially as well. All right. So with that being said, please start voting. There you go. Councilor V. Hill? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. All right. Thank you. All right, Council. I'm moving right along here. All right. We're under uh, committee reports. Do you have any committee reports? There you go, Councilor Daniel. I'm you you got a hot finger tonight. I you? do. I'm, I'm, I'm on it tonight. <laughs> uh, so the Housing Authority did meet uh, last week, and they wanted me to express thanks to City Council for approving the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, they understand that we will have that discussion every year, but they were very um, appreciative of that. They are also, and Holly, I wasn't sure if you had heard from Anna yet, they are changing the day um, that they will be meeting in January. So I really am appreciative of them not changing it before then uh, to the third Wednesday from 11 to one instead of the fourth Wednesday. So that shift is happening. We did mention it to the candidates tonight that were um, being interviewed. So they, the person who was interviewing for Housing Authority did know that tonight and said that was okay with them. Um, they are working to train their maintenance team up um, and really the, the new maintenance supervisor is really trying to build their own so they can do a lot of their own services, which I think are really neat instead of um, contracting things out. Um, the retreat, as we've mentioned a couple times, is coming up. I personally cannot remember the dates, but I didn't know if we could let the candidates know when that retreat was, if they get chosen and voted in on October 18th, if that's something that they could manage. So that might be just a conversation with Anna um, about if that's if that's possible, because it would be really hard, I think, for a new board member coming in right after the retreat when potentially they could have attended it, even if we need to talk about the, the voting and things. Um, but those are those are my updates. Okay. I don't see any other lights on. I don't see any hands raised. So we're done with the uh, committee reports. That's going to bring us to uh, staff announcement. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's very brief. I just want to remind council that next week there are two meetings. Um, one of them is you, you may not have to attend, but it's the Meet the Candidate Forum on October 10th. Um, and that is at 6 p.m. here in council chambers. And so um, for those of you who are running as well as getting the opportunity to meet um, some new faces who are running as well. So i um, looking forward to that. The other one that you do have to attend is we do have a special meeting um, for an executive session on Wednesday, October 11th at 6 p.m. Also here in the chambers, that is to conclude the evaluation process of myself and the city clerk. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Sanchez. So up next, we have uh, council comments. I got a little fired up tonight. Um, so I just want to say how much I appreciate what council um, has done and that we have created, we have presented um, a unanimous front to our community saying that we know housing is important to us. We are working to work on community solutions to community challenges and hoping to have hard conversations. And so I appreciated all of the comments that we had tonight because those conversations need to happen. Um, and we need to be able to stand by what we're saying and why we're saying it and being transparent and being able to hear the concerns that folks have and hopefully explain it in a way about our role in serving the entire community. Um, the other thing that I wanted to let you all know about is that I did attend the CML webinar last week. So I am one step closer to my <laughs> one credit hour being shy of my CML leadership um, award. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. So I count Councillor Vijo, I think, has his hand up. OK, go ahead, Councillor Vijo. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Just two two things. Uh, one is in response to what was said at, uh, during citizen comment about this culture of fear uh, with the, with the folks who work for us, who work for the city. Um, I kind of agree with Eric and Heather that that's not what we want. That's not what we are. But if it is out there, please step up and say something so that we can address it. Um, I don't want anybody who works for the city to be in fear of 
what they think, their opinions, whatever, and how that might get them fired. Second is um, this is a constituent concern or a question, Heather, is uh, this person is a uh, musician, and he asked me if if we had any ordinances or anything on the books, uh, he would like to maybe plug in his guitar and play music at the park, just like like a street a street musician, uh, like on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I didn't know what 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 any if we had any laws or anything on that. So, if you could look into that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And so, Councillor V Hill, do you just want me to get that information to you, or did you want to send them my way? Uh, if you can get it to me, I'll get it to him. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we don't have any other lights on, so um, up next we're going to have a executive session. So. Go ahead, Councilor Daniel. You're on fire tonight. I am. I move that we um, go into executive session pursuant to CRS 2460024B to receive advice from the city attorney concerning um, a complaint resolution and implications for the city. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, we're we're going to vote on this, but no. After we come out of the executive session, no additional uh, business will be discussed. And um, so, council, if you could start voting. Councilor Hill? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay. If we could, let's take a quick break and just um, start at a, in about at six minutes from now at nine o'clock. Okay. So everybody can take a quick break. 